Welcome to Offscreen. This week we're reading Set It Up by Katie Silberman. Two young assistants realize that they can get more free time if they set their bosses up on a date. Um, so Katie Silberman doesn't have any credits or she has a she has no writing credits right she is i guess she's written a couple shorts but she uh -huh. was an assistant to a writer on the tv show ben and kate for what is that what is that yeah it's a tv series i've never heard of it um it starred dakota johnson and lucy punch i don't know these people i'm not, I mean, not trying I, to be I difficult mean, i don't know it was like a tv show she's kind of famous now she's in a lot of movies dakota johnson okay um, I think Lucy Punch was in a Woody Allen movie. Um, but she also sold another spec script, right? Wait, first I need to see if she was in a Woody Allen movie. Yeah, she was. Um, yeah. She, yeah. Katie Silverman, the writer, sold... Well, I don't know if she sold it, but she appeared on... It was on Tracking Board, right? Yeah, it was on Tracking Doesn't Board. That, doesn't that mean it sold? Mm, I don't know. I don't know, but it's called Hard to Get. I think she was featured on the Young and Hungry list. I mean, it just seems like there's a lot of lists out here. Yeah. But she seems to be doing pretty well for herself. Yeah. Speaking of which, if I think we mentioned this last time when we were saying that we were going to read this. This is from the the brand new 2015 Blacklist. Released, I guess, by the time you're listening to this, two weeks ago? Yeah. Um, but we don't really know much else about Katie Silberman. No, or exactly where this script is in, uh, in its life. Yeah, and it's life, but, well, we'll talk about it. Do you want to get into the synopsis? Sure. Um, and we're going back to me reading a synopsis. Oh, so I, I guess so we should just talk about oh. it in terms of genre first. And it's, oh, okay. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's just uh, a... It's like a rom-com, right? Sort of a rom-com. I think it's almost more of just like a straight comedy, just like, sort of like farcical. Yeah, but... It's sort of, it's it's sort of a rom com, but I I have reasons to to not want to call it that, but we'll get into that later. Okay. Um. So yeah, the the summary. Okay. Harper works for a legendary sports writer, Charlie, for a ruthless venture capitalist. That's what I called him, a venture capitalist. I think he's something like that. Yeah. Some kind of businessman. Both of them admire their bosses just enough to tolerate being constantly overworked and underappreciated. The two assistants meet one day in the elevator. Turns out they work in the same building. And as they bond over their shared grievances, they hit upon an elegantly simple solution. Both of their bosses just need to get laid. Why not by each other? Harper and Charlie, as their assistants, already manage every facet of their bosses' personal lives, using their knowledge of each one's likes and dislikes, they orchestrate a few chance encounters between them, and sure enough, the bosses hit it off. But it's not until they send them on a weekend getaway that Harper and Charlie realize their own affection for each other. They spend a drunken night out together, which ends in pizza at Charlie's place. Not exactly romantic, and yet somehow perfect. Just as their relationship begins to blossom, Harper and Charlie's bosses announce that they'll be getting married. However, while helping to plan for the occasion... Charlie discovers that Rick, that's his boss, still plans to sleep with his old ex-wife on the side. Harper finds out too, and is outraged when she realizes that Charlie was simply going to let it happen. They each warn their, their bosses not to go through with the marriage, and the truth comes out about the setup. When it's all over, it takes Harper and Charlie being set up on a date to get them back together to live happily ever after. Cool. Or so it would seem. I mean... Yeah, I guess it just ends with them on a date. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're an optimist, I guess, <clears throat> sure, happily ever I think after. the movie would want you to believe they will live ha happily uh, ever I after. I think the movie... Give it, I give the screenplay a little more credit than that. What do you mean? It's not just, like, blindly lovely, lovey-dovey. Oh, I mean, yeah, no, maybe. that's definitely true. Um, but, but like you were saying, you were calling it a rom-com. I don't know, man. I think the romantic comedy, they all follow such a similar formula, even more so than other genres. There there are so many scenes that are the same in all rom-coms. Rom um, but 
a lot of those aren't here. I don't I don't see those really. I mean, I don't know. I think I, I see this as a pretty. I get what you're saying. To me, but I think there's a lot of playing with the conventions of of uh, that genre. But my reason for for not really thinking this of this as a romantic comedy is that their relationship does not really take off very very soon at all. Like it it, it Whose really. Relationship? Oh, I mean, um, Harper and Charlie. Right. Their relationship is really like non-existent for the majority of the script. And it's not even like a will they won't they kind of thing. I mean, I think any any non idiot reading this script is going to know that they're going to end up together. Mm-hmm. But there are like no real developments in that in that direction until really late, right? Like they they have that like that one I night think, together. I think I think you're seeing. I think you see the the groundwork being laid. Like in very indirect, in a very indirect way throughout the screenplay, and I think you can look at it kind of as them trying to write a rom com for their bosses. Like they yeah. go so far as to like orchestrate a meet cute. Yeah, they call it, they call it a meet cute, which yeah, which for anyone who doesn't know is just the term for the usually sort of contrived scene where the two people in a romantic comedy meet seemingly by chance, and it's like some kind of cutesy, silly, probably awkward scenario right so in a way the screenplay is kind of setting there's two relationships in the screenplay and it's kind of setting just juxtaposing the contrived one against like the beginnings of their of of the one yeah. that eventually becomes the the actual relationship between eventually Harper. but yeah it takes is that problematic so though long well yeah okay here's the th- another thing i think that's like almost more true to life like it's an interesting observation yeah, but and not like directly pursuing each other. It's just a more yeah, incidental sure. thing. Fine, but I still think it takes way too long for for them to like formalize it in any way. Like it's not until uh, let me let me find what page that that one scene where they actually do spend the day together and they end up having pizza. No, but, I think it's alluded to long before that. It's alluded to, yeah. There's the like subtext is there, but but like that's how it that's how it goes. I I think like I, I said, don't, they're in, not trying to make like a traditional or like a classic rom com. Who's not the writer? I don't think. Well, okay, but that's fine. I I don't I don't yeah. necessarily need it to follow all of the conventions, but I think there are reasons for some of these conventions. And my problem with this is that yeah, you have these two relationships. But they're both progressing in the same direction for a long time, and there's no variety about it. Like, to me, the the point of having two similar kind of plot lines, I think the point is you want to have them at opposite places at different times in the story. I think it's a lot more effective if, for example, the boss's relationship had been going really well, and then Harper and Charlie's relationship was going really poorly, or vice versa, because um, right now, I don't even know what I would call the end of Act 2 for this. I feel like it's just kind of when the bosses say they're getting married. But at that point, again, Charlie and Harper are in a good place, and so are the bosses, which doesn't create much tension, doesn't create much drama. I mean, I know this is a comedy, but still, you need some kind of tension And I feel like it was all just going way too well for way too long. And it wasn't until they both said they were getting married that, you know, well, a couple, a couple really stupid things happen, which Mm -hmm. are the only sources of conflict in this whole thing, if you ask me, which are like, there was one time where their bosses are going to go out to dinner and they, they didn't like the restaurant that they chose. And it's because you realize Oh, Harper and Charlie had some kind of miscommunication where both of them thought that it was up to the other one to set them up on a date. Because even, and I don't understand how this is possible, but this entire time that their bosses are together, their two assistants are deciding everything, like where right. they're where they're going to go. I think it's kind of a joke on just how dependent the boss is on the assistant. I guess, generally. I guess, but that was such a lame source of conflict for me that like. That was the only time where it seemed like the boss's relationship was really in jeopardy. And it was just because they forgot to choose a restaurant for them. Well, it was in jeopardy at other points. Or, I mean, it wasn't certain. Like, at the baseball game, it wasn't guaranteed that they that were going to... That was still while they were building it. I feel like it It was still... 
in the world. Right, but, but I mean, they got married pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. I, I still think there wasn't nearly enough tension there. It seemed like it was all going way too well. And then even after, you know, I mentioned in the synopsis how, like, Rick, Charlie's boss, was going to keep seeing his ex-wife. Mm-hmm. So Harper goes to tell her boss that. And even then, that doesn't stop their marriage from they're still going to go through with the marriage even after she tells her this you know Mm -hmm. harper goes and tells her boss like hey yo this dude you're going to marry he's still seeing his ex-wife but then they still are going to go get married and they have to stop them at the very end of the script in the the sort of climactic scene you know charlie and harper confront them at the airport they're about to leave for this destination wedding and then that's when the truth comes out about the setup and everything, and only then do they decide not to get married. I don't know why it wasn't a deal-breaker for her to learn that he was still seeing his ex-wife. Explain that, Stephen. Because she's, like, vulnerable. I don't know. It's just like how it's later revealed that Rick is still, like, wants to get back together with his ex-wife. Uh-huh. Like, why is he even wasting his time with uh, Kirsten, then, if he's still into his ex-wife? That's a valid question. Well, what, like, they're, because they're, like, insecure, because they're, like, people that are just insecure, and... Uh, I think you're ascribing a lot of complex emotions to characters like in a very like silly movie that is not trying to go that I don't think this movie is that deep. silly. I think it is. I think it really articulates the Harper, um, what's the dude, Charlie uh, relationship, like, well and subtly. Their, like, man, just, their, their rapport is great. Their rapport is great, and you see that build from, like, you see that build over the course of the movie. But I still think you're reading too much into the bosses, because I I still think I don't know because we see because we we see Kirsten like the entire movie, uh, Harper's boss, the entire screenplay, and she's just obsessed with work and she's insecure about the fact that all of her friends are getting married, and like or not getting married but like having baby showers and all these events that she's invited to that she doesn't really want to attend to, and she feels excluded from that, like excluded she, from her friends. Despite was, the fact that she's a hugely successful professional, who she'd be like really proud of, like which Harper says at one point, really proud of the fact that she's like killing it in a male-dominated profession, sports journalism. That should reflect so well on her, but she still feels insecure about the fact that her friends, her social circle, is doing all these things that she, if she hasn't yet because she's put her career first. I see what you're saying, but none of that really played for me. I think it. Hmm. I I saw the intention there, and they were. I felt like they were trying to flesh but out, I, I flesh think out it, the characters. I think, it, but... I think it comes into focus more when it's contrasted with the kind of the real relationship that emerges between Harper and, uh, and Charlie. Charlie. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember these character names. <laughs> um, I love your notes. I'm sorry, I'm always spying on them, but no, go for it. One of them just says. That real shit, though. That, that assistant <laughs> I, I, I job forget, life. I forget what... Uh, oh, that's when, when Harper laments the fact that she like wants to be a sports writer herself, but she has neither the time nor the energy to write anything mm. when she's done with her yeah. like, grueling days at the office doing you know the busy oh, work for her That's for right her at the same time that there was a line that I really liked where Harper's complaining about how, like, you know, I, I, I try really hard to be a good assistant and... I'm spending so much time on it that I'm not practicing my writing. I'm not going to be a good writer. And Charlie's like, "Oh, that's not true. You're you're not a great assistant." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the the jokes here are really good. Yeah, the There's dialogue enough... is really good. Yeah, um, I liked also later on when because I like how kind of the friends of the protagonists of Harper and Charlie kind of knew that they were into each other or like a good match right. for each other. We and they, should, we should ex- they knew it before they knew it themselves. We should explain that a little more. So Charlie has a roommate named Duncan. Right. Who is, I guess, I, I don't know. He's gay. That's like his whole character. He's successful, good looking, and gay. Yeah. And moving out of the apartment that he shares with his best friend, Charlie. Yeah. And then um, Harper also has a roommate named Becca who is going to get married. She her her boyfriend proposes very early on. That's kind of part of the whole setup. Uh which again it seemed like they were trying to create more urgency, but it didn't really they didn't follow through on it at all much. Um how 
His roommate is leaving. Her roommate is also going to be going to live on her own. Both of them need someone or someplace to stay. Mm -hmm. But those stakes never... It never pays off. Like, they never are actually forced to go somewhere else. I guess they have enough time that it doesn't matter. And that's I thought that was the whole point, is that at some point in the script, they'd be like, oh, crap, I need a place to stay. And they would, like, you know, move in with each other or something. Well, that'd be, like, really imprudent. (laughs) They'd barely know each other. But that's the... the, You've got to think that's where they're going when they set that up in the beginning of the script. I saw... I mean... I actually never thought about thought about it in those terms. Really? Yeah, I thought of it more as just so innocent, Stephen. I thought of it. <laughs> I thought of it just in terms of illustrating each of their own like dissatisfaction compared to how they perceive other people's lives, uh-huh. or just how like they feel that through working so hard with their career, they've sacrificed and thus lost out on another part of life, life outside of that. So it was like something that. They both were envious of, and they could relate to each other because they both were shared that envy. Yeah. There was a very short scene that I feel like is a secret key to the underst- oh. understanding of this script yeah. for what for what it should have been, but okay. what what it still didn't deliver on, which is being a like a regular sort of romantic comedy. But see, I don't think it should have been that. I think it's better than that. It's it doesn't. Regardless, yeah. Just uh, okay, follow me okay. for a second yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This would be in a normal romantic comedy to me, like the the midpoint of the story, and that's about where it falls here. Um, so they're they're both telling each other what their boss is like. Yeah. In a in a another person, so that they can try and help them build that connection. And Charlie tells Harper, "Oh, Rick really likes women that are." waxed just completely smooth and in the next scene harper harper not her boss harper gets waxed yeah which i thought was the script trying to say like look she's doing this for charlie like that was supposed to be a hint that charlie would also i didn't read it that. that way i thought it was something to the effect of she can't just go up to her boss and say hey you you need to get a bikini wax or whatever. Why? Because that's why like would a it weird, help if that's she like did a weird it? thing. Why would it help if she did it? Because then she can go in and say, "Oh, I just did this," and then put the but idea that never in her happened. boss's head. That never happened in the script, though. I thought that was implied. No, I don't think so. I felt like she interpreted Charlie as being like, "Right, look, look guys like this." And yeah, she's like, "Oh," but I but I don't think she was. Yeah, she probably did it because she thought guys liked this, not because Charlie liked it. Mm. I saw it that way as well. I don't know. Because I don't think she's aware of her feelings for Charlie at this point. That's a problem. Especially, that's, especially that's, what I, that's what I was saying was the problem, though. Because like I said... I don't, I don't think that's a problem, though. Uh, what, it is. is it? You can't have an entire second act, which is like the bulk of the story. Why? Because like, it's all building towards... It's so boring to watch these two people who clearly no, like it's, each other. No, it's looming under the, it's looming under the surface. Can I finish? Yeah, I guess. It's, it's really boring to me to watch these two people that clearly they're supposed to be together, and that's what the, the script is heading towards, but the entire second act, they're not doing anything to actually pursue that. They're just all caught up in the surface level thing of setting up their bosses, but they never once really admit or acknowledge their own feelings for each other. It's so frustrating like that, but it's like can, frustrating for them because they're not like they're not having fulfilling relationships. It's frustrating to me too. I feel like you can sustain that for only so long, and in a usual script, it's like the first half of the second act, and then the second half, it's them either like resisting that attraction and therefore like being well, punished it, for it. That and does like happen. Things, things go really badly. Like she bounces at the when they're eating pizza. She no, she doesn't bat. That's not like bad. They're not on bad terms. No, but she she preempts she preempts a romantic moment. But that's that's totally different. I feel like at the end of Act Two, they should have been way more at odds with each other. But at the end of Act Two, they were still not even admitting the fe- their feelings for each other. Right, they weren't like ready to. That takes that's way too long. It has taken way too long for that to still be in that. Stage. I think it's still. 
I don't know. Something more either needed to develop with their relationship or the the thing with the bosses needed to develop sooner. My problem with the with the bosses was that like just how they were manipulating them so much. Like that's kind of <laughs> mess. Like I guess they eventually Yeah. Harper eventually acknowledges the fact that it is pretty messed up how far they've manipulated their bosses into like like to the point of marriage. And well, like that's kind of cruel. Yeah, and was... when she when she tells when she confesses to um to Kirsten her boss. Mhm. Like how devastating if Kirsten has like general genuine feelings for Rick the, to then to be told that no your feelings aren't real you've just been tricked you've just been fooled into falling for this guy and this guy doesn't even like turns out he's sleeping with his you ex. You have so much empathy for these characters in this comedic romp. I wish I could say the same, but I don't me, know. Yeah, I I, I I like I like this quite a bit. Really, like so much more than I was expecting. I liked it on a surface level, like the jokes and the dialogue and everything. But man, I felt like there was no substance to it, and really, there were no there. There's there so not... many great touches, like when Becca, when at Becca's engagement party, uh-huh. Harper comes up to her and says, uh, "I'm gonna Charlie and I are gonna leave and go get pizza." And, she, and Becca lets her go. Yeah. And then the pizza arrives just after. Yeah, you realize like, that's Becca, great. She didn't want to tell her, oh, we have pizza coming because she was going to let her go and her, have, have her little let her moment. Fr- yeah, exactly. That was nice. But she was like rooting for her friend for this relationship that her friend wasn't even like. But little, aware little of. moments like that, a screenplay do not make. Oh, I. Like I disagree. You need a you need a, is those little you need, moments. You need you need those moments, but you need them to be connected by some something something more, a through line. And I feel like there was not enough turning points in the story. It was just like the boss's relationship was getting better, 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 better the entire time until the truth comes out and then it goes but, wrong. Right. And then their relationship like I said, it was just bubbling under the surface for all of Act Two, which took way too long. And then they had that one stupid little hiccup, which I still don't even What's get. Like, well, like she freaked out because she found out that Charlie was hiding this thing about his boss still seeing his ex, his ex wife, and he was just gonna let him keep doing that. That's such a. I don't even know why they care so much about that. I don't know. First of all, I don't know why Charlie would keep that a secret from Harper. Like probably because he knows that Harper will be pissed off. But I, I feel like none of that was set up very much. That came out of the blue, just as just as a way of having some kind of obstacle in their relationship, which otherwise there was nothing. It just it was like a really sudden and brief thing at the very end, and then the, the rest of the time it was just smooth sailing. I don't know. I think we've reached an impasse about this. Um... <clears throat> I I enjoyed it. It was funny, but yeah. But you see, you see their relationship. Like, what if the whole, what if the screenplay is like it's it's the entire thing is like the meat cute for <coughs> wheezing for for Charlie and Harper. Then that's annoying. I don't want to watch a meat cute Why? for the entire length of a movie. Why not? Because a movie is supposed to have like plot development. I don't know. I thought. I thought the articulation of their like relationship was was pretty good, and it was slow and like believable. There was no relationship; it was just them having funny little banter back and forth while they were trying no, because you can up. see like their like shared enthusiasm when when something that they worked on and devised together like comes to fruition, like when they finally when when the bosses finally kiss at the Dodgers game, mm-hmm. like that's I think that's like the first moment where. They Where do. they're, like, seeing, like, how much, like, what they can achieve together, kind of. Yeah. I don't know. I guess we're at an impasse. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, it doesn't amount to, like, much character development to me. Because, yeah, still, there wasn't... Yeah, there, there, just, there just weren't enough possibilities explored. I, I wanted to see more extremes and things going badly between them. Uh, I, I guess I'm okay with the slow bubble. I think it's like you said. It's like yeah, it's like watching a whole movie that's a meet cute. Yeah, I think they it, didn't even kiss. They didn't kiss the whole time, did they? The entire movie, no. Like that's pretty rad. That's like unconventional. It would be rad if if I felt like it was supposed to be 
unconventional, but it still felt pretty basic. Just... I think I feel like I feel like the writers commenting on the the traditional rom com. I think you're giving the writer too I much credit. I don't think so because they're trying to because do this whole setting, meta thing. They're setting they're setting this they're setting up their boss relationship as a prototypical rom com relationship, and then they're illustrating like the failing like how that won't work by contrasting it with. I disagree. No. And then the thing at the end with them being set up and that works to get them back together, that's so I thought that was a little cheesy. I thought that was a little I brief. Think that that undermines what you're saying because it does work for them, even though it's the Well it stupid... works to get them back in the room, but it only works to get them back in the room because together because of everything that happened before it. I don't know. I thought there were some good observations. I thought it was really funny and it read really fast. Yeah. Because it was under-described, a lot of things, I felt like. And yeah. It is kind of annoying sometimes when it, it does feel like, I don't know, maybe this is this is why these people end up on the blacklist. They know their strengths and they play to them, but this is someone who's clearly good at dialogue, and so they really don't spend any time on character or like scene descriptions, and the setups for some of these scenes are very tenuous to me, and it's very, very thin. Like, Do you have any in mind? Well, like you were like generally. you were saying, like the baseball game. I mean, oh, oh right. she just knows someone who is, happens to be the, the mascot, mascot. Right. and so then you get this big set piece of a baseball game. Right. Um, there, there was very movie. There wasn't a whole lot of causality. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, verdicts. Um, what do you think? I. <laughs> I don't know. Are you ready? Go for it. You go first. Uh. Pass on the script, consider on the writer. Hmm. Because I like her dialogue. I want to. I want to go. I want to go. I don't know. I want to go with a recommend for the screenplay. Dude. No, do I? I don't you know. You just did that last week. I know. Can we, can we pause this or let me? Well, just talk it out. Do I? I want to see this movie get made. Do you? Yeah. What else have I recommended other stuff before? Manchester, I'm sure. Manchester, Joy. Did I recommend Passengers? Which one? Passengers. Yeah, which or Passengers? The space, the space one. I don't know. I forget. We should keep a log of all. Yeah, because I like this about on par with that. With Passengers. Yeah. That's a weird comparison. I feel like these are pretty different movies. Well, different, but they're both like I like them equally. Hmm. Um. Like I, I think this screenplay can be improved. Yeah, I think it can definitely be improved. And I think with another pass, I would give it a firm recommend. But now I want to give it like a shaky recommend slash strong consider. So you're considering both the writer and the script. Yeah, I, I like them both a lot. Okay. I think I think this writer can do another draft of this, and then it will be a great screenplay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't give it. The, I wouldn't give it the wholehearted recommendation that I gave Manchester by the Sea. I'd give it more of a tepid recommendation, but it's still very strong. S- I, or strong consider to a mild recommend, I guess. All right. I don't like your qualifications. Just it's a one word answer. You consider? No, 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 no. I can I can put two words there. I can have an adjective. But I I, mean, I guess I'm trying to take the script on what I consider to be its own terms, and. I try not to bring any of my own baggage about what genres I like and stuff to the table, right. uh, but I do think if it appears to be trying to go for one of those genres, it should either ascribe to that genre or more clearly make a statement about that genre and try to subvert it in some way, which this one, I, I didn't feel like it was clearly doing that. I felt like it was just mistakenly like not... Not fulfilling I guess I guess that. I give it the benefit of intention and you mm-hmm. don't. Yeah. That's probably I guess where our difference lies. So what was your final verdict? Consider on oh consider on the writer, pass on the script. Okay. So Yeah. I guess maybe I give it a strong consider for the screenplay and a recommend oh for the gosh. writer. Oh my gosh. How many times are you gonna uh, revise this? I'm just revising it because I think the ending is a little rushed. Oh, uh, a lot rushed. A lot rushed. Oh, the ending could be improved, but another draft for the screenplay. Maybe maybe it gets mm-hmm. there. All right. Uh, next week? Next week. We know what we're reading. Yeah. What? What is it again? I forget. It is uh, called... 
Loudmouth? Loudmouth. Is that the one? Loudmouth, yeah. Wait, where's the... Let me find the logline again. Okay. Yeah, next week we're reading a script from the hit list. We will describe what the hit list is next week, but it's another list. Um, and this script is called Loudmouth by... Oh, gosh. How do you say this name? An- Anayat. Anayat. Anayat Fakare. All right. I'm not going to say it. I'll let you just... I'll let that hang there. But it's called Loudmouth. And it says it's the incredible true story of how Morton Downey Jr. destroyed objectivity in American news media.